In this episode, we're going to look at the, the first and second generation Chevy Volt from an owner's perspective. And I'll show you the differences between the two cars and why this is an excellent choice as a used car now that it's out of production. I figured a video from an owner's perspective of the Chevy Volt because as an owner of two Volts, a first generation and a second generation, I think I'm in the perfect position to explain the differences and advantages or disadvantages of each. So I realize this video is probably a little bit late considering that General Motors is no longer producing the Chevy Volt, but this will serve as a good guide for someone who's looking to buy one on the used market, because I think either one of these cars would be an excellent buy uh, for a second-hand vehicle, just based on the reliability that I've had out of the first generation. A couple of key differences in the car. Note the height on the first generation is about six inches clearance from the ground to the bottom of the door. Just over six inches. We have about eight inches of clearance. So the ground clearance is higher on the second generation Volt as opposed to the first. Height wise, the first generation Volt is approximately 54 inches uh, ground to the top of the roof line. Generation Volt about 57 inches clearance. So the, call, the car is taller. Length wise, I only have a 12 foot tape measure, 12 feet brings the tape measure to the front of the wheel well on the first generation. Let's see how long the second generation is. And as you can see, second generation is slightly longer as well. So we have a slightly higher car, slightly longer car. And that is apparent in the inside space. The second generation is certainly more roomy than the first generation. The size is nice because if you're over six feet tall, I'm six foot two, and I find I have just a little bit more headroom in the second generation Volt as opposed to the first. Not that I find that the first was cramped, it's just that I have more headroom. I don't have to lower the seat down to the absolute lowest position um, to feel comfortable. I can operate it with the seat raised up a little bit higher. Of course, a higher seat makes getting in and out of the car a little bit easier. Now, the lower driving position of the first generation Volt, of course, does have some advantages and cornering is a big one. The first generation Volt handles better than the second. You can take corners faster with less body roll and yes the tires will emit a nice growl if you take a corner at high speed but the car feels planted and it sticks to the road almost like a sports car. I've been really amazed with the actual driving performance, the driving experience, going through the twisties and so forth on the first generation Volt. Second generation is not bad, but there certainly is a little bit more body roll and that's gonna be one because the car is a couple of inches higher off the ground for, for starters. And two, I think that uh, the first generation Volt being a heavier car is a little more rigid and it doesn't the, the frame doesn't flex quite as much it just feels more planted on the road when you're taking corners at speed of course both cars are hatchbacks and you can fold down both seats the seats fold flat and opens up a heck of a lot of cargo space i've put large tvs in the back of my in my back of my car large console radios uh, all kinds of stuff i fit in the back here with those seats folded flat you can really pack a lot of stuff in the back of one of these cars so they're great for hauling you know, hauling large items around under the hatch floor is where the 12 volt battery lives on both the first and second generation. I've taken advantage of this space where the tire flater is because there is no spare tire on these cars to give you a tire flater. I've taken advantage of that location just to mount my ham radio in this car. The other car underneath the back um, is where you would carry your travel charger and, uh, and accessories like this but you've got a little bit of space to carry stuff hidden in the base there's also a compartment over here on the left side of the first or the second generation this is where i actually carry my travel charger notice i've got the travel charger from the first generation because this is the car i'll be taking on road trips not the other one generation also comes with a cubby 
uh, underneath the uh, floor that you can store stuff. I used to store my travel charger, which I don't carry in here anymore, but I used to carry my travel charger there. Here's the tire inflator that comes with this one. And access to the 12 volt battery is under here. Let's take a listen to how well these doors sound. This car, remember, is uh, eight years old. But even after eight years, when I close the door, a nice solid clump. Heavy doors on both the first and second generation. We'll take a look at the second and see how the door closes on it. And, and here's the second generation again. A nice clump, nice heavy solid door. The biggest differences of course are inside and in particular the center stack. On the first generation Volt, and a lot of people this did not appeal to, it um, has a lot of these soft touch buttons. Now, the first generation Volt does have a CD player in it, whereas the second generation does not. So if you've got CDs, that's nice because you can pop a CD in here and play it. And it will play CDs both in standard audio CD mode, or if you have a CD that's loaded with 150 or so MP3 tracks, it will play them as well from the disc, which is a nice feature. I miss that on the new car. Because there's times where I get, you know, I'll, I'll make up a disc that's got my favorite tracks on it. And I just want to throw it in the car. And yes, I, I can put it on one of these things, no problem. But, you know, it's a lot sometimes more convenient just to have a disc and just fire the disc in. Or if someone gives me a disc and says, here, take a listen to this, I can just pop it in the car and listen to it. Can't do that on the new car. I have to rip it and put it on either an SD card or a USB stick. Now, the first generation also features USB playback. In the center console is where you'll find the USB port. I can't show it to you on this car because this car now being my wife's car, it's full of crap. So I can't show you the inside of it. In fact, I could barely get the USB port in. But let's turn the car on. So if I press the brake and press the power button, the car will spring to life. Which is good because um, I need the air conditioning. It's getting warm in here already. Let's turn that off. It's the radio that's playing. If we look at the um, the speedometer, this the, the main display between the steering wheel, we can look at what I've done on this car over the past eight years. So you can see how many miles I've got on here. I've got 140 it was 143,000 kilometers on this vehicle now, and there has been no maintenance issues whatsoever. Zero. If we look here over at the range, you'll see that my battery range is 61 kilometers, which is what the car was rated when it was new. Over the last eight years that I've owned the vehicle, there has been absolutely no degradation in the battery range whatsoever. And that's important because a lot of electric cars out there now, a lot of the earlier Leafs and stuff, they did experience range degradation after a couple years, not so on the Volt. One of the reasons I bought a second Volt was because this one here has been so good and other owners of Volts that I've talked to and I know several people that have got them have all experienced the same uh, experience as far as maintenance goes. I've had no major faults with this car. There have been a few quirks. I'll show you what they were. Um, they, they, they are to deal with the door handles and uh, Door handles. What else is new? That seems to be a thorn in Tesla's side is their door handles. But uh, it's just the buttons on the outside, on the driver's side, the button has failed. So I have to unlock it with the fob. And the key fob was another uh, weak link on this particular model that they have solved on the newer models. But anyway, we're going to take the car out just for a little quick drive here momentarily. Uh, as you will see here, and my wife drives the car now, um, she doesn't. She puts a fair bit of mileage on it. She's put 1,700 uh, kilometers on this thing in the past uh, month or so that she's had it. And she's burned through about half the tank of gas in that because when she goes out to visit her mother, her mother is beyond the range of the battery. Normally when she's driving the car around in her day-to-day -day operations, when she's going to work and back and servicing her clients that she, that she works with, her range is all within the 60 kilometers throughout the day, so she never burns any gas, other than when she goes to visit her mother, which is again, her the round trip to see her mother is around 80. So she burns a little bit of gas when she makes that trip. But um, as you can see, even as it sits now, uh, the, the, the car has not been filled. I, I, I haven't filled the tank on this thing in, uh, I think, 
four months. I think the last time I put, we're right now in July, and the last time I put gas in this thing would have been February. So um, since February, there hasn't been, uh, there's been hard, there's been no gas uh, or very little gas used. 14.1 um, liters basically over the last 1700 kilometers. Uh, I reset this to zero when she took possession of the car just so we can keep track of how much fuel she's used on it because the tank was full. When I gave it to her, I hadn't burned any gas on it whatsoever uh, from the time I filled it up last. So when I gave her the car, I said, here, let's reset the, uh, the trip counter. Uh, if we go to the B trip counter, which is accessed through the config control over here, this is the total of what's been put through the car. As you can see, the it is maxed out at 99,999.9 .9 kilometers. It won't go any higher, but the fuel gauge will still show liters. In the lifetime of the car, I've put 3,289 liters of fuel through the car, which sounds like a lot. But really it isn't because the only time I've burned fuel is when I've been on road trips. If I switch the the um, unit over to U.S. Where are we here? U.S. Uh, readings. So now we can look in, in miles. You'll see that over the last 1,064 miles, 3.7 gallons of fuel have been burned. But over the lifetime of the car... All 89,180.3 miles, and this when it, this gets to 99,999 miles, it's going to stop as well. But in the lifetime of the car that I've had it, 89,180.3 miles, 869 gallons as the f fuel that has been used for an average economy of 102.7 miles per gallon. Now, keep this in mind. This car has been to Arizona twice from Vancouver. It has been down the California coast twice it has been to las vegas twice it has been to edmonton to, on one trip it has been through um jasper and um, banff and lake louise and all the way over through montana on another road trip and up to, and, and, and these are all separate trips too and another road trip it went up to uh, prince rupert and been all over the province so those gas miles that you see were gas miles that were racked up on road trips over the past eight years i've been taking this car away for typically two to three long road trips every uh, year so that's where the gas has gone on here and that's why i bought the volt because i didn't want to have to rely on finding charging stations when i am traveling it should be noted that the range in miles on a fully charged battery is 38 miles which is 61 kilometers, and that has not degraded over the eight years that I've had the vehicle. Take a look at the uh, the center stack, which is what some people like and some people hate. It does take a little bit of getting used to, but it's really not that bad, although the new one is much better. They've got these soft touch controls, and how these work is you just touch them. And if I touch climate, for example, it'll bring up my climate control. And now I can use the touch screen if I want to just direct all the air into the, the side vents here. I can just tap there and it'll put the air into the side vents if I want the air on the floor. Tap there. If I want both, there. If I want floor and, and defroster, I can tap there. Or if I press the auto button over here, the car automatically decides where it's going to send the air. And it decided that the car is hot and it's going to cool me down quickly. Go back to eco mode to shut that fan down a bit. Fan speed's controlled with, you can do it either here, if you've got this display up, or if I press the back button, I can do it through the fan control button here, fan up, fan down. Heat control for heating and cooling is over here. And, um, Got a button over here for your phone. If you if you're using a phone, you can tap this button. I don't have my phone set up here, but you can uh, do you can do OnStar hands-free calling if you've got OnStar, which I don't, or you can do it through your phone itself by just tapping phone. But I don't have my phone paired to this. My wife's got her phone paired to this car, obviously. Home button returns to this page where we can select what we want to listen to. If I want to listen to FM or USB media, I can do it through here. I can also do it through the, the main menu on the screen. If I tap FM, for example, it'll go to the FM radio. Uh, if I want to change source, uh, there's a couple ways I can do it. I can either do it through the source button here, or I can just tap source on the screen here. 
I tap source, it gives me options of what I can listen to, AM, FM, XM radio, if it were subscribed, or uh, CD player, which I don't have a CD in here now. If I tap USB iPod, this will play from the USB stick. And uh, now I can play it. I can advance the tracks either by tapping here or I can do it from uh, the advance button on here as well. Where is it? Here's that one there takes me to the next track. Or I can do it from the steering wheel by just clicking up and that'll take me to the next track. Claim control can be controlled from the steering wheel or from the uh, volume control itself. There's also a direct tuning dial, which is nice because you can you can go directly to uh, tracks and tuned radio stations and stuff. As you can see, this shows me what's coming up next. I, I have the uh, unit set for random playback, so you can just dial through and, oh, I want to hear a different song, and then just press OK, and it'll go to that track. Hazard Flasher is there. Door unlock and door lock. This locks and unlocks all of the doors. A parking brake is selected down here. And to release it, you press the brake. And press the button in. Um, this will stop the car, by the way, if you're not on the gas. So if you need to stop the car in an emergency, like if your brakes were to fail or something, if you've got your foot on the gas, this does nothing. But if you have your foot off the gas and you pull the parking brake, it is going to apply the parking brake and bring the car to a very quick stop um, by basically putting the slamming the back brakes on. So if there was a if there was an emergency and you had to stop the car, you could uh, pull the parking brake as long as your foot's not on the gas. If your foot's on the gas, it won't do anything unless you shift to neutral first. So if there was an emergency this will stop the car. They call it a parking brake, but it will stop the car. It puts on the brakes, electrically puts on the back brakes. So it will stop the car. I have tested it. I'm not gonna do it in this demo because it results in locked up tires. <laughs> it will stop you. It puts the brakes on very hard and the tires will lock as you are stopping. But I, I did try it once. Uh, in a controlled environment, I was on a, a, on a, a track and I took the car up to 100 kilometers per hour. I wanted to see what would happen if I hit the uh, hit the the, uh, the parking brake. And yes, it does stop the car, and it stops it relatively quickly, as quick as you can expect by slamming on your parking brake. No different than any other car. If you stepped on the the, uh, the handbrake or pulled the handbrake or stepped on the parking brake pedal, um, if you it, it, it will stop the car in an emergency if if need be. But that's. It's mainly for if you're going to park on a hill and you don't trust the parking pole, you put the parking brake on and it'll lock the back wheels. Um, what else do we have to go on here? Oh yeah, seat heaters. It's got uh, three temperature seat heaters for both front seats, driver side and passenger side. And uh, that's that's the center stack, as uh, confusing as it looks, with these silly soft touch controls. It's one of the things that. One of the things, I, I mean, it's not something that really attracted me. I don't particularly like the layout of it, but it is what it is. It is functional. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I'm neutral on that because I learned how it worked, and I find it was quite easy to operate. These all light up in the dark, so it makes it easy to see. Uh, so I, I never really had any issues with the center stack on this car. I know some people are going to say, oh, it's the ugliest dash ever. And you're right, it's not the most attractive dash. And when I show you the inside of the new car, you'll understand why they changed it. They say this one was kind of, uh, um, it leaves you wondering what they were thinking when they, when they designed this. Uh, it's the ugliest part, I think, of the car is this. But I say some people love it, some people hate it. Myself, I, I don't hate it, but I'm not a fan, let's say, okay? I don't hate the design, though, but I think they could have done better. Considering what the car cost when it was new, they could have done a better job of the infotainment. But the infotainment is functional, and it works, and it works quite well. Actually, it works excellent. Limitation on the um, 
MP3, the USB, is it's it's like ten thousand tracks. You can put a hundred and twenty eight gig um, USB stick in. They have to be formatted in FAT32. It won't take it if it's an EX FAT or NTFS. Uh, it has to be f formatted in FAT32. You can put a 128 gig memory stick in, but the limitation on this is uh, it's, it's 9,993 tracks, I think is what it would, I found it limited to because I had a I had a memory stick in that had like 13,000 tracks and it could not see all of them. That problem has been solved in the new one. I've got 23,000 tracks in the new car and the, the infotainment center can see all of them. When you're playing the FM radio, of course, it's going to show you the name of the track that's playing. It has the, the uh, RDS display. Does not have uh, HD radio, and for that matter, neither does the new car. It's strictly analog FM and AM. Oh, you've got a rear window defroster over here as well. On oh, that's front window defrost, that's rear window defrost. Kick this one in and it puts the puts the system into high defrost for the front window and the rear window defrost is on that side a mute button here to shut off the sound which you can also do from the steering wheel that'll mute it there roll on the left side of the the wheel turn on the cruise control and then you just pull it down to set and that will also decrease your speed or increase your speed and this button cancels it so you can cancel either by tapping the brake or by pressing that button. Big button down on the side here selects whether you want to change um, between different options on your display. If I scroll through the display here, you'll see, you know, give me my tire pressure, any messages from the system, and scroll through 99% oil life. It's another thing about the, uh, the Volt is that you only have to change the oil every two years unless you do a lot of driving on the gas engine. If you're doing a lot of driving on the gas engine, it will tell you when to change the oil. Other than that, you do it once every two years. So for this car, it's had three oil changes in its entire life. And that's a big savings because it uses synthetic oil. So you're looking at a hundred bucks to change the oil on this car. Uh, a regular car, if you're changing your oil every three or six months, you know, that's a hundred bucks every time you change the oil. This one here, you do it every two years, so there's a huge savings as far as maintenance. The car drives in pretty much total silence. The older models don't don't have a noise maker outside to warn pedestrians, so you have a little button here on the uh, turn signal indicator, which sounds the horn. That's to warn pedestrians that you're coming because the car at slow speeds is exceptionally quiet. And if you don't, uh, you'll find people are going to walk out in front of you if you're not careful. I've had that happen to me many times. One thing I've noticed on the first generation Volt is that they have held their value quite well. I was, uh, when I was buying my new Volt, there was a 2014 up for sale at the dealer. And they were asking $22,000 for a 2014 which that's a lot of money for a car and the car had the car I looked at it it had 145,000 kilometers on it so it had more mileage on it than my 2012 but say 20 22,000 dollars is what the dealer was asking um, for it I mean it was in it was in relatively I would say good shape I would say as good a shape as mine it didn't have any dings or or dents or anything on it and just the normal wear and tear for the upholstery and stuff but uh, yeah it was a lot of money for a used car but again the cars have proven to be very reliable and uh, they are going for you know good a good price if you can get a good a good one you can, if you can get a good deal on one I would say grab one because uh, they are a solid reliable car they handle really nice and very smooth um, some of the features I mean my this one has actually more features than my new one because this was a premier so this was the top of the line uh, the only feature that this one doesn't have is it didn't have the DVD navigation which was another couple thousand dollars but it does have the Bose premium sound as my new one it also has the Bose premium sound as well on it but this one here again was was one of the top of the line models when I bought the car uh, eight years ago the car does have regen on demand just like the new one but it's accessed a little differently on this Volt 
if you want to slow down and recharge the battery while you're slowing down, you can either depress the brake slightly or you can take your foot off the gas and shift to low range and that'll slow the car down fairly quickly. Not as fast as the new one, which we'll see when I take the new car out, but it does put the car into regenerative mode. And for that matter, you can actually drive in the low range mode. You don't have to switch to low. I made a habit of doing it every time I was uh, slowing down. I just got in the habit of, of pulling the, the uh, gear shift or the selector. It's not really a gear shift, it's a selector. Pulling the selector down to, uh, to the low range to slow the car down. And then when I was driving, put it back in drive. The difference, of course, is when you're in drive or the D mode here, when you take your foot off the gas, you coast and the car won't slow down other than the regular rate of drag from you know friction and stuff in the bearings and so forth. But you'll coast just like in a regular car. When you switch it down to the lower range, the car will decelerate. And if, you, if you're going down a hill, for example, you switch it into the low range and it'll keep your car from speeding up going down the hill. It'll actually slow you down and you can set the cruise control at a certain speed. Like if you're going down through the mountains, you can set the cruise control at the speed and it'll keep the car going that speed all while putting power back into the battery many people when they're driving around town will keep the car in the low range all the time therefore they don't have to put their foot on the brake in stop and go traffic other than to come to a complete stop so as i'm driving here i'm i've got the car in low range and i can drive it in what's called single pedal mode so when i take my foot off the accelerator the car will begin to slow down immediately Keep in mind that on the first generation Volt, it does not turn on your um, brake lights when you go into this mode until you actually put your foot on the brake. So if you're slowing down on the freeway, keep in mind that uh, keep an eye on the guy behind you. He might be asleep at the switch and not notice that you're slowing down, which I mean, it's no different than someone driving a standard car and taking their foot off the gas and shifting down to slow down, right? Their brake lights don't come on either. That's a problem that's been solved in the second generation where they put uh, the brake lights on as soon as the car starts to slow down. Of course, the cars feature a backup camera. That's standard on all the new cars anyway, but uh, first generation, it uh, features a standard definition backup camera. I know some people have uh, upgraded their camera, uh, which some people have done uh, to improve the camera. I've never had an issue with the camera, although the night sensitivity on the first generation Volt, the backup camera is not as good as it, uh, as it could be. Another complaint I have over the backup camera on the first generation Volt, besides the fact that the quality isn't very good, it's not that sharp, is that um, the aerodynamics of the car, um, the mist when it's raining off the road tends to get uh, tends to get sucked up behind the car from just from the aerodynamics and tends to uh, get on the lens so you'll find that with the first generation you're always having to go and wipe the lens off especially if it's been raining otherwise you'll end up with a blurry picture which is uh, you know I mean kind of defeats the purpose of having a camera if you can't see anything behind you but uh, that's been an ongoing issue and again it's all to do with aerodynamics of the car it's not a huge issue because my other my I mean my my company truck it's exactly the same as soon as it starts to rain the backup camera is kind of useless but it's just something worth mentioning that you will have to uh, clean the lens on it when it's raining hard and uh, the lens will get dirty and you'll have to wipe it off other than that it does the job you've got this drive mode button what the drive mode does is it switches the car between normal sport and mountain mode now, on 2013 and beyond, there's another mode called hold, and I'll explain what that is. And my 20, 20, our 2019 Volt also has that mode. Normal mode uses the entire range of the battery before the engine starts. So you get your full you know, 60 kilometers or so of range, uh, 40 or 38 miles of range before the engine starts. Sport mode will give you a little bit more acceleration. It basically modifies the uh, accelerator so you don't have to hit it as hard to really jump off the line. It gives you more of a sporty, uh, a sporty mode of driving. It does not increase the power 
it does not increase the zero to 60 time it's this it's the same it's just it gives you more of a, a spirited feel and gives the, the throttle pedal a little more response makes the car feel a little bit quicker but uh, as far as changing the performance of the car it's still go still gonna run the same it just makes it drive a little different mountain mode keeps a 40% reserve on the battery so what it's going to do is if I switch to mountain mode whoops watch what happens to the uh, mileage on the battery so if I go to mountain because there's still lots of range on the battery as soon as it switches to mountain you'll see that now it's only got 36 kilometers of range in the battery and what happens when that gets down to zero is the engine is going to start but there's still 40% of the range remaining in the battery therefore when I'm going up a big mountain I won't run out of power if you don't go into mountain mode and you start to climb a huge mountain such as the Coquihalla Pass or going up through the Hope Princeton by the time you get to the Hope slide area coming out of Hope you're gonna find that you're out of reserve and the power is going to be restricted and the car is not going to go faster than about 55 miles per hour even floored so uh, if you're going through the mountains you have to put it into mountain mode before you hit the grade typically you would put it into mountain mode about 10 minutes before you hit the uh, the start of the, of the hill and then you'll have enough time to build up some reserve or if you know you're going to be driving through the mountains put it in mountain mode right away and it will switch over to fuel a little bit sooner and then you'll have your reserve to climb the mountain and then once you hit the summit and you're coming down it's okay then to switch it back to normal mode and uh, you'll your battery range will restore you see now it went back to the 58 which is what's remaining after I drove around here for the past uh, four or five four kilometers I guess I drove it today on the first generation volt there's a button on the inside of the door that's used to open up the hatch for charging there's another button up here that is used to open up the gas tank for refueling only two problems I've had to date with the first generation volt is the button. This button is supposed to unlock the doors and the button has failed. I figure maybe some water or something got into it over the years and it no longer unlocks the car so I have to use my fob. And the other problem is the fob itself. <clears throat> there was a metal uh, key ring that went through the back here and it broke. So I have to carry it in my pocket. Of course, it's got the flip out key, which is used if the battery goes dead, to unlock and lock the car. Speaking of the battery and the fob, if the battery and the fob were to go dead, you just throw the, the, the fob into that bin at the front, which also has a USB, or no, it has a 12 volt uh, outlet for powering things up like dash cameras and stuff, which is switched with the car. So when you turn on the power, the power comes on to the 12 volt power point and when you turn it off it goes out. Charging is done by either a level 1 120 volt charger or a level 2 240 volt charger. To charge the battery it takes about four hours on a level 2 charger. Actually no, a little bit less than that. Three, About three hours and 45 minutes on a level 2 charger and uh, about 12 hours on a level 1 charger uh, actually eight hours if you're uh, charging at 12 amps and if you're charging at the reduced eight amps takes about 12 hours to charge from uh, 120 volt outlet if you're on a dedicated 120 volt outlet it'll do it in about eight on 240 it'll do it in uh, I say about three hours and 45 minutes for this car and this one here takes about four and a half hours on a level 2 charger so now let's have a look at the second generation volt as you can see from the front they are totally different looking cars from the front. Gone is the button required to open up the charge door. You just press it and it opens on the second generation. Second generation Volt also features a faster charger on the Premier Edition which will charge it in two hours at a public charging station because it'll charge at 7.2 kilowatts as opposed to just 3.6 which is the LX model and the first generation was a, a a three point actually 3.3 kilowatt charger or is it 3.6 we'll say 3.3 no 3.6 on 240 volts if it's on 208 volts it's 3.3 .3.
because uh, the charging time is a little bit longer on public charging stations. It actually takes over four hours on a public charging station to charge that car. But this one will charge up quicker because it's got the 7200 watt uh, uh, charger built in. The second generation Volt, which is the 2016 to 2019 models, also features a third seat in the back. So it's got three seat belts, so you can carry five passengers. Although the passenger in the middle is going to have to contend with having to straddle the battery and the cup holders. But you can put three people in the back. I would say small people, like a child in the back. Or even a child seat in the middle uh, uh, seat there. But you can carry five people if needed in the 2016 to 2019 Volt. You notice in the second generation Volt is how much more roomy it feels. It is bigger inside, right? There's no, there's no question that the driver and passenger have more room in this car. It's a dust magnet. The only downside is the screen. Not only is it a fingerprint magnet, it's also a dust magnet. But um, here's the layout of the second generation Volt. Again, nice touchscreen. It's very simple to operate. Let's turn the car on by holding down the brake and pressing the power button. And that'll spring everything to life. Here is Of course, the air conditioning comes on right away. Um, here's the, the the layout of the dash on this one. As you can see, I've had this car now for a little over a month. And uh, here's my, my EV range. Oh, I'm a little bit low today. It says I've only got 83 kilometers. Usually it says like 85. It's rated at 80. Although, on average, I can get closer to 90 uh, on average and the maximum I've ever gotten on the battery on this is 103 kilometers in EV range But 83 kilometers is easy to get it's because I was doing some freeway driving at high speeds and that reduces your range a little bit But it's rated at 80 kilometers 50 miles and on average I'm getting between 85 and 90 is what uh, my average has been um, As you can see since I've had the car I started out with a full tank of gas and uh, the car is 3,873 kilometers on it now. Of that, I've put 3,691. And as you can see, the fuel gauge has only just started to move because I've only gone into the gas mode a couple times when I've went on a longer trip. Other than that, it's all been electric range. So my average so far is 0.4 liters per 100 kilometers. Now, if I put it into miles per gallon, it will say 250 plus. Guess difference, the center stack. On the center stack, we have basic controls for the climate control. You've got a, a dial for the fan speed. A dial for the temperature, which reads out the temperature right on the dial itself. And you've got simple buttons. Power on and off for the climate control. Defrost. Vents. Floor. And you can set combinations. So if I want the cold air to the vents and the floor, I just turn both of them on. If I want to have the cool air or warm air going to the vents, floor, and defrosters, I can turn all three on. Right, I have a rear window defroster here. And of course, to get the maximum um, defrosting I can just tap that button and it'll put everything into max so now we're not going to try and conserve power it's going to use more power it's actually consuming one kilowatt now but it'll turn the air conditioning on full or the heat on full to defrost a window quickly if I want to get out of max go back to eco and it'll drop down to a half a kilowatt of, of power that it's using for the system auto if I put it in auto, it uses a humidity sensor that's built into the underneath the window here in this little sensor and it will direct the air automatically either to the front window or to your your air vents here and cool you down nice and quickly and it'll automatically switch and it'll turn on recirculating and so forth. There's the recirculation button. So you can do it manually or you can do it by the auto button. So you've got a choice. Economy, 
or and this when you turn that off it's now fan only and it tells you right up on the screen here so I say economy mode or if I press it again it says fan only so I can turn the air conditioning off and just use the fan and that'll of course save power on your battery touchscreen itself it's got your standard AM FM as well as XM and it'll pair with your phone and it will um, play from a USB stick or in my case I've got an SD card it goes right down here right next to where the phone plugs in right there I've got a 128 gig SD card and I've got tons and tons of music on there and I got a power point down here that I can plug my dash cam in there's one more power point in the back for the rear seat passenger but there's only two of them in this car not three like the other one gear shift you got your hazard flashers this is the parking brake works the same as the other one pull it and it turns on the parking brake and it can also be used to stop you in an emergency if need be you've also got the mode button and you've got your traction control off which I can't understand any reason why anybody would want to turn the traction control off because this thing's got so much torque it'll burn out on dry pavement even with the traction control on I don't even want to know what it'll do with it off because if I floor it it's hard enough to keep this thing from burning out with the traction control on mode button like the other car switches between the various modes press mode and shut that fan down a bit it's getting kind of loud if I press the mode button you'll see here normal sport mountain if I put it in mountain mode it's going to decrease the range from the battery and now it's going to tell me okay it, it, it hasn't told me my EV range is decreased but it shows me here that the engine is going to start when the gauge gets down to this point that's what the reserve is going to keep in the battery there's one more mode on here and that mode is called hold and what hold does is hold switches you over to gas mode immediately and we preserve all of the battery so now I'm on fuel and if I start to drive the engine will start and I'm burning gas so if I put it in hold mode I can preserve the battery now the only use that I can think of for hold is if you're in an area where you are paying to enter uh, you're paying a smog tax to enter uh, a, you know, a city for example uh, London does this but uh, if you're driving an electric vehicle you're exempt from paying the toll to drive into the city if you're driving a gas or diesel you're gonna pay that toll so hold mode can be used to preserve your battery when you're driving in from the suburbs until you get to city limits and then you can switch it back to electric mode and the engine shuts off and now you've got your full range of battery so that you can drive in those restricted areas that are restricted to EV vehicles that's the only reason to ever use the hold mode at least the only reason I can think of anybody that chooses to burn gas which is going to cost them five times as much as the electricity to charge it is insane if they're going to just you burn gas for the sake of burning gas um, but it's there if you need it it's there the center on this car is actually quite nice got a home key which is here and a, and a touch screen and Let's me select audio phone, my energy meter. I can set up users, which I haven't set up. Go into settings. It has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and has some apps, which I haven't installed anything just because uh, uh, there's, I don't have the uh, 4G on here. Recent phone calls. Please, somebody phone that number and prank them, please. That's that's the prank. That's the last call I got on my cell phone. That is the, uh, that's the, thank you for being a WestJet customer. We have an offer for you get all those calls all the time it shows your recent calls that have come in on the phone so please prank that number somebody let's 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 swamp that uh, system and I, it's probably somebody who doesn't even know their number has been spoofed uh, anyway um, audio gain okay, FM radio I have the Bose premium sound system in here um, Sirius XM I've still got my sample uh, package that hasn't run out yet I never listened to it and this is my SD card and uh, I can select tracks by either tapping the button here or tap the touch screen up here I've got it set in uh, oh. I got it set to uh, random play so I've got uh, 
20, 23,000 tracks on here. So I can play a lot of music, all different styles of music. I got rock, I got hard rock, I've got uh, hits from the 80s, I've got jazz, I've got pretty much everything on here. So it's kind of it's kind of enjoyable to take a road trip and just put the thing on random because I never know what I'm going to get next. Wheel controls. Down here I've got the selector for the radio or the MP3 player. I can skip forward and skip back. If I click it once, it skips back or clicks forward, it skips back or skips forward. If you press and hold, it actually goes into a fast forward. So if I put the music on here for a sec and I press and hold this, it skips ahead. So if you've got a long song, I try not to get a copyright strike here, so. Okay, we'll mute it there. It, this one probably won't pull a copyright strike just because it's a live performance that I downloaded off YouTube. Um, anyway, that's beside the point. There's a heated seats for the driver and passenger. It's also a heated steering wheel on this one. I'll turn on the steering wheel heater. And over here we've got the settings for cruise control. This turns the cruise control on and off. It shows up on the dash here as a as a icon. And then you've got cruise control cancel, set, and decelerate, resume, and accelerate. On this side, we've got our mute control. That'll mute it, and it'll also hang up the phone. If I press the the speech button, yes. Tune radio to ninety nine point three. Okay, tuning to ninety nine point three FM. And there it is. I've got the. Radio. Yes. Tune to one hundred one point one. Okay. Tuning to 101.1 .1 FM. That's how that works. Plug my phone in. The USB cable. It will launch Android Auto. And then I can take advantage of Google's, some of Google's suite. Directly through the uh, touchscreen in the car. If I want to send a message to somebody, I can say, Okay Google, send a text message to Dave at work. What's the message? This is a test message. Here's your text to Dave. This is a test message. Do you want to send it or change it? Send. Okay. Message sent. And here's the message I just received. And if I reply to myself, it will be read to me over the speaker system in the car. So I'm going to send a message back saying message received loud and clear. And I sent it. And I just received a message that says right here on my screen. Now, if um, it'll send a message back, I can just tap. Uh, I'm stopped, so it'll actually show up on my screen here. But um, if I'm moving, it won't. It won't show up on the screen it'll come up with a message that just says you've received the message and I could tap the screen and it would read it to me just like that Dave says message received loud SND clear do you want to reply of course uh, <laughs> yes yes what's the message uh, yeah whatever okay uh, I'm driving okay so piss off Here's your text to Dave. Hike, yeah, whatever. Okay, I'm driving. Okay, so piss off. Do you want to send it or change it? Send. Okay. Message sent. <laughs> yeah, right. So, I mean, it's, um, 
it's a work in progress. It works. Gets your messages out without having to take your uh, your hands off the wheel or take your eyes off the screen. If I was moving, uh, I would not get that message. So let's maybe let's send another message while I'm driving. I'll I'll, I'll preload a message and I'll get the car moving and I'll hit the send button and we'll see what happens here. So I just sent a message and I see it won't tell me the message. I can hit play message. Dave says, okay, drive safe. Do you want to reply? I tell you, one of the reasons that driving an electric car is so nice is when you see gas prices like that, $1.53.9 a liter, what a joke. And it was up at 173 at one point there a few months ago. With Android Auto comes apps, which is part of Android. And it also worked with Waze. I don't have Waze installed. Actually, I do have Waze installed. I just don't have it active. I'm using just a standard uh, Android navigation, which is kind of annoying because it always puts in these places that you've been in the past and suggests that you might want to go back there again. But uh, the navigation system is actually pretty good. I can just give out the magic, okay, you know what, command and uh, give it the address that I want to go to and it'll come up on the screen and give me turn by turn directions to get there. So this is pulling the maps from my phone itself and my phone screen is out. So it allows me to use Google Maps or Waze Maps and I'm sure there's probably other ones that will also work with it for navigation. going into a quiet neighborhood here so you guys can hear the uh, sound that the car makes to warn pedestrians so if I hold the camera outside the car you'll hear the noise that the car makes So that's the pedestrian warning sound that the car makes. Second generation Volt is very nice to drive. It's very smooth. It's almost like a bit of a luxury car. Lots of room inside. As I said, the, the first generation I think handles a little bit better because it is lower so it corners a little better than this one but this one's not bad a nice old car idea how quick this car is and that's with the traction control on it just screams okay maybe it won't do that <laughs> somebody had fun down here didn't they yeah someone probably just burned about a hundred dollars worth of tires up there maybe it won't quite do that but pu smell the marijuana growing holy smoke like the grow ups aren't even that close to where I am and it just stinks. Launch when the light goes green here. That's with traction control on, if you can believe it. Traction control off, I would have smoked the tires all the way across the intersection. An acceleration test here. As soon as the light goes green, we'll see you guys how fast this thing will accelerate. So I'll get a shot of the, uh, the speedo here. fast enough of course we've got on-demand regenerative braking on this so I just pull the paddle in on my left side of the steering wheel here and it'll put on the regenerative braking so I can slow down without putting my foot on the brake I can still select low range and uh, we'll take this out and then take it up to, to a quiet street here and I can demonstrate the difference between the paddle and the low range of the Excel of the gear selector and both because um, in this car you've got two levels of regeneration 30 kilowatts from shifting to low range or pulling in the paddle and uh, 
50, about 58 kilowatts if you use both. So right now I'm just using the paddle, although we're not gonna generate that much because I'm not moving that quick. But uh, I'm gonna drive back down to where I was before where I can open it up a bit and then we'll show you how, how good the uh, regenerative braking is for slowing the vehicle down. Okay, so what I'm gonna demonstrate here is the braking ability. So I've got the vehicle already in low range because it can drive it in single pedal mode. And if I take my foot off the accelerator, you'll see that the regenerator braking is about 30 kilowatts, right? Now, I'll go back on the gas, we'll speed up a bit. If I pull both the pad flappy paddle and take my foot off the accelerator, we'll see that it's now regenerating over 50 kilowatts of power and it slows the car down very quickly, as you can see. We'll take it around the corner here onto another bit of a straight stretch and do it again. So we'll accelerate up to like 120 and then I'll put on both the regenerator braking and the low range. And this is how quick regenerator braking will slow the car down. And we accelerate up to 80 clicks. And it'll pull it down even quicker. Around the corner here, into the straight stretch, and then regenerated braking by itself by switching to low range. And if I apply the flappy paddle, it'll slow it down that much quicker. And of course, without switching into low range. Now I'm in drive, if I just take my foot off the gas, it'll coast. If I pull in the regen on demand flappy paddle, it'll slow me down at 30 kilowatt hour, or 30 kilowatts, I should say, not kilowatt hour, 30 kilowatts, which is the same as if I switch to low range and just take my foot off the accelerator, it'll generate the same amount of regenerative braking. So there's the two levels of regenerative braking. One is switching to low range, and the second level is by pulling in the regen on demand paddle, which will slow the car down very quickly. Another relatively quick run. Speed limit exceeded, you think? driving electric cars they've got all that power on tap and uh, it just never ends until the car gets to the maximum speed so it, it's very easy to exceed the speed limit I try not to that's why I have that little alert on there I have it set at 120 which is uh, faster than I would ever need to ever go and that's to alert me so that if I'm just cruising along the freeway, not really paying attention to my speed, and it creeps up there. It lets me know, hey, better time, better slow it down a bit, because that's uh, that's 40 over our regular speeds on most of the highways here, which are 80. So um, we have we have freeways here that have speeds between 80 and 120. Is our our speeds here in BC? So I set it to 120, which is the maximum speed for the Coquihalla Highway to warn me. If I get over that, it beeps to let me know. But uh, they creep up speed pretty quick. I'm trying to be discreet when I'm working with the camera here because uh, I'm getting a bit of a trouble for using handheld electronic devices. So I'm kind of holding it off to the side. I can't see what I'm shooting. I'm kind of holding it alongside of me and kind of uh, just... So I'm not looking at the screen. I don't know exactly what I'm shooting I'm just kind of pointing it and hoping that I get what I hope I'm getting out the front window last thing I didn't mention is there are controls on the back side on the right side of the steering wheel that will control the volume of the sound system which you can control with your right hand while you're driving so on the left side you've got the on-demand regenerative braking the low beams on the volt the 2019 volt are LEDs the high beams are halogens they cheaped out there. I would have gone LEDs both, but uh, halogen lights for the high beams, the low beams are LEDs, and they actually illuminate the road 
very nicely. On the back, LED tail lights, traditional incandescent turn signal, and, um, oh, and of course LED brake lights. Turn signal lights are incandescent as are the backup lights and in the back here there's the high mounted stop light which you don't see it until it lights up. The backup camera on the 2019 volt is a high definition backup camera. It actually gives you a very good lick out the back and it has the um, lines that will show you where you're going. They can be turned on and off and as you turn the steering wheel Turn the steering wheel to the left, it'll show you that you're going to end up over here. And turn the steering wheel to the right, and you're going to end up on the other side. Power lock buttons have been relocated on the second generation to the door. There's one on each side so that the passenger can open the door as opposed to them being in the center stack. And you've got controls down here to control your power windows and you can lock out the back windows and I think this also puts a child lock on the back doors at least it does on the other car uh, but you can lock your back window so they can't be rolled down and uh, and these buttons here control which mirror you want to adjust so this is your adjustments for the outside mirrors left mirror or right mirror is what those are to adjust You've got a control down here for the headlights you can turn your lights you can't turn them off unless you're actually stopped the headlights are always automatic so they're going to turn on in the dark turn off in the daytime you can turn them on manually parking lights and full headlights and if you're parked your headlights will be on at night you can click that it'll turn them off but as soon as you go back into gear they'll turn back on this is the control to adjust the, the, the display brightness at night and this one here actually adjusts the ambient lighting in the car by ambient lighting I refer to the lights in the cup holders and there are also lights on the at the front of the car in the uh, in the foot compartment for where your feet are. Red, yellow, I guess that's a lighter color yellow. That's supposed to be white, green or cyan, blue, and green. Your lights are LEDs on the second generation. And of course it's got the standard OnStar crap that uh, if you want to subscribe to OnStar, I don't have a subscription to OnStar. But button here, this turns off the lights when the doors are open. So normally when you open the door, the lights will come on. But if you don't want the inter interior lights coming on, you can turn them off so that the lights don't come on when the door is open. And this one here, this one just turns the lights on, both front and back. So you can turn on your map lights separately, or you can turn them all on with that. And of course the passengers in the back also have individual control for their individual lights. This is turning them all on and off, but there's a button up here that allows individual lights to be turned on and off. And they will turn off after a set period of time, I think it's 20 minutes after the car's turned off so that there's no chance of them running your 12 volt battery dead. This was just a quick look. It's probably gone on longer than I would have liked, but this is a look at both the first and the second generation Volt from an owner and driver's perspective. Would I buy another one of these in a second? Unfortunately, GM has done a bonehead move and they've stopped producing them. Now, the rumors are that the drivetrain for this is going to show up in an SUV in 2021. Let's hope that the rumors pan out because they have a really good product here. Uh, this is the best car I've driven. I love it. And I say I, I would buy another one of these in a heartbeat. If you're thinking of buying one of these cars now, there may be a few new ones still available on dealer lots. I would say if you're going to get one, jump at the chance to get a new one because when they're gone, they're gone and then you're going to be stuck with a used car. And the problem is these don't come up that often on the used market. So a lot of people that have bought one are like me. They're hanging on to their first generation and buying another one and, and passing it on to a family member because the car is just too good. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one real soon.